Welcome everybody. My name is Tia and we also have Tina McIntyre from Seminole County on. Hi, and everyone. today we're going to talk to you about the right plant for the right place. And this is really Florida Friendly Landscaping 101 because this is the most basic and fundamental and low hanging fruit and high impact that you can do when you're growing plants in your landscape and selecting you know, vegetables from your vegetable garden or edible fruit trees for your landscape, whether you want the ornamental landscape or low maintenance landscape, we're gonna show you um, how to choose the right plant for the right place. So let's get started. Excellent. So the Florida Friendly Landscaping Program, we have programming for um, residential people like homeowners, renters, residents, also professionals in the green industry like commercial landscapers. And we also have a section for home builders and developers. Yeah, and the Florida Friendly Landscaping Program is actually a partnership program between the University of Florida IFAS Extension and the Florida Department of Environmental Protection, which is their logo is on the bottom right there. So it's really a water quality program with a landscape disguise. And it's a very much a partnership program as well. So like Tia mentioned, I'm in Seminole County. And so we have support from Seminole. We have support from Orange. Um, lots of different counties support the program. Could be a utility company that supports it in your area, depending on where you're zooming in from today. And then of course the water management districts, we partner with them and work with them as well. Yeah, um, part of Orange County has the um, South Florida Water Management District. That's right. Yes, the waters of Orange flow every which way it seems. Yeah, up and down. So here's a slide that shows the nine principles of Florida friendly landscaping. And today we are just gonna be discussing principle number one which is the right plant for the right place. But the other principles, they all are very important and they work together to help us conserve water and fertilize appropriately and mulch and do strategies to build soil and prevent pollution from entering our water bodies. And also, you know, just beautify our neighborhoods, enhance the local wildlife and biodiversity of bees and butterflies and you know, provide the needs of people and wildlife. That's right. And you might say, how does my landscape connect to the local lake? But every time it rains, you know, there's that watershed connectivity and our landscapes also need water. So it's a water quantity program as well, where we want to conserve that water from the aquifer. Um, just a quick plug. If you guys have questions, feel free to put them in the Q&A. If you have a you know chat, you could use the chat for that. Yeah, that's right. All right. So here we go. Right plant, right place. This is the overriding principle in Florida friendly landscaping. And pictured here is a shade garden, a very low maintenance shade garden. These are slow growing plants that don't need a lot of sun and they don't need a lot of water either. So using this principle, following it correctly, it's going to save water. There's research that the University of Florida has done that shows planting the right place in the right place reduces your water needs, and that in turn can save money. That's right. And there's a potential for, you know, it really depends on the design that you select, but with Florida Friendly Landscape, there's a lot of potential for saving other resources, you know, like using less fertilizer, less pesticides with our integrated pest management that we recommend, um, less irrigation, mowing, and, and that kind of a thing. Yeah, when you select the right plant for the right place, sometimes it just turns into a do nothing landscape, like some of the native plants, like the, the palm trees and stuff, like, they can survive off of rainfall alone, no irrigation, no fertilizer. That's right. We're mimicking that native system. A lot of great plants out there. So we're going to get started with our site analysis. And what we're going to talk to you today is going to kind of go along with the Florida Friendly Landscaping Guide to Plant Selection and Landscape Design. And you can download that for free online right now, you might want to click on the link and follow along while we're talking. 
That's right. I just chatted the link to that free guidebook. All right, great. Yeah, it's, it's a great publication, a lot of good information on there. And we'll be talking about some of the things in there, how we select plants is based on our climate, our, the sunlight, is it full sun or shady? Also the soil moisture and the soil pH, which we'll talk about, and then the hardscape and plant characteristics. Okay, looks like I just accidentally ch chatted the link to only Tia, so I'll be sending it to everyone now. All right, send Apologies, it. Apologies, everyone. Yeah, so a big part of you know what you want to plant is your own personal needs and desires. Of course, you want to pick the plant that is the right height and the spread for your location, but you know it's up to you whether you want to plant a native plant that provides nectar or pollen or is a host plant for butterflies. Or if you want to grow a food garden and, and grow bananas and papayas and, and bamboo like I do. Um, another thing is the maintenance level. So depending on how you like your plants, um, some things you can let have a naturalized form and very little pruning and some plants lend themselves to that because they're short, whereas other plants you might want a more manicured look like some people like that Asiatic jasmine for the ground cover, but you always have to be trimming it. And that can be high maintenance. That's right. Why don't you tell us about this one, Tina? Yeah, so this is a page in the book. Um, if you have the hard covered one, like I do, um, it's gonna be a different page, I think 31. And then in the virtual link we just sent you is page 33. Um, just a slight difference there, but essentially it walks you through everything that you need to know about right plant, right place. So starting with your region, so if you're in North, Central, or South Florida, those are just general kind of categories to say, you know, where are you in the state? Then after that, you're going to look at those USDA zones, which Tia mentioned we'll get into further. But that really matters because in South Florida, we're going to be able to grow tropical things where in central Florida, we're more subtropical. And so we don't want to be really selecting those cold sensitive um, tropical plants uh, within reason. There are some, you know, of course it varies by species, but this kind of gives you an idea of all the different parameters to think about. So the mature growth height and the, the rate of growth, if it's uh, going to be a, a quick growing plant or maybe a slow growing plant. Um, if it's going to get really big and wide, or if it's kind of slender and tall, the pH, which we'll talk about, but there's um, plants that need specific pHs to be able to actually absorb nutrients. So we want to make sure that our pH is appropriate for the plant that we're looking to, to select. Um, and then it goes through the other parameters, which include water, if it's a, a more aquatic type plant or a drought um, resistant type plant where it likes more dry areas, um, full sun, like Tia mentioned, if it's full sun or shade, if you're attracting wildlife, all these things are things you want to consider. And the book walks you through each individual species and each individual one of these parameters. So it really is helpful when planning your site. Yeah, it's great. Like every plant has all these things listed for it. And then I get the question a lot, what is a Florida friendly plant? Well, this is the answer right here. Does it grow in Florida? Is it suited for your site? And also we can't um, call any invasive plants Florida friendly. We wanna do native or non-natives that are suitable for our area. So as long as they match your site and they're intended for Florida, then they are Florida friendly. That's right. All right, so let's talk about the USDA plant hardiness zone map. So this is important for choosing which plants will grow in your zone. Like you might see, you know, you might be in some garden groups online and they're like, oh, look at this pretty flower. And it just doesn't grow in Florida. You know, it might grow up in Maine or in California or up in the Rocky Mountains or in some valleys in Virginia, but will it grow in Florida? You want to look at the plant. You know, you can Google the plant name and see if it's in zone nine. That's what we are here in central Florida. If you're in Orange County or, or Seminole County or 
Brevard County, we're zone nine, Tampa is also in our zone. And you can look at the scale on the right hand side, there are many zones, zone one through I think it's 13 now, uh, like Puerto Rico, for example, is tropical, and they don't get temperatures, you know, below 50, you know, 55 degrees, where here in Florida, we're in zone nine, and our lowest temperature, you know, the extreme minimum temperature, which this is gauged on, is uh, about 25 to 30 degrees Fahrenheit. So plants yeah. get a little freeze, but not too much. Well, and that 32 degrees Fahrenheit is really the magic number because anything below 32 is considered freezing. And for those little cells within the plant, um, you know, they can only take so much of that if they're, you know, unless they're suited and have evolved in that colder climate. Yeah, that's the, that's the key point there. Is it going to freeze or not? And, you know, this can be manipulated a little bit by finding some microclimates, which we'll talk about later. But the next thing we want to consider is sun or shade. And this is based, you know, if you're in the northern hemisphere, the sun angle and direction is usually coming from the south, you know, especially now in the winter, in the summer, it will be more like directly overhead. But there also might be some trees or you might have a shadow from your house, like the north side of your house will be pretty shady, whereas the south side will be pretty sunny. And pictured on the left here is a picture of a pigeon pea and there's two photos there. The one on the right is happily flowering and producing gondule beans, whereas the picture on the left, this one is just planted in too much shade and it's not gonna flower or make um, beans because it's just too shady there. Yeah, and it could be even an abundance issue where maybe it does start to flower a little bit, but it's not gonna produce as much as it needs. And so we want our plants to achieve that maximum beauty, maximum production, and they're gonna do that by getting those suitable sun requirements. Yeah, other plants like uh, croton, you know, they have that colorful foliage, but if they're in too much shade, then the colors won't be as vibrant. So here's the next one, soil moisture. So what is your site like? And a good time to look at this is in the middle of summer when it rains all the time, then you can really see the wet and the dry spots. So. Um, up in the top left is those symbols. Um, so the empty water drop means it can take dry or drought. And then the dark water drop means it likes wet conditions. And this isn't always like uh, black and white here because there are some plants that can take wet and dry conditions, right, Tina? Absolutely, yeah, a lot of our native species really enjoy uh, a range and a range of pHs, a range of, of, of soil, you know, moisture and wetness. So pictured here, we have the saw palmetto um, and saw palmettos will take it very wet and they'll also take it very dry. Um, same thing with our, like we mentioned, our state tree, the sable palm. Um, they can do a range of, of wetness, a range of pH. Um, and another one that comes to mind is the cypress trees. So they're usually associated with our wet areas, but they're, they can do well in dry areas as well. Um, and then I do see we have a link for them um, about a blog, Tia. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you can put that in the chat box. That shows you some of the drought tolerant plants for Central Florida. Yeah. So, you know, not one is necessarily better than the other. It's just finding what your site is and then really working with that is the best way to go. Yeah, that's right. Observe your site and at different times of the year. So let's talk for a minute about soil pH. This can be a complicated issue, but um, it's don't make that much of a big deal about it. We do recommend to get a soil pH test and you can send that up to the University of Florida to our soil lab. Um, Tina, can you put a link to that in the chat box? Sure thing. Okay, great. And if you look at the range here, pH range, so pH range goes from zero to 14 and most plants like it, you know, between 
5.5 and 7.5. Actually, the median pH level for all of Florida soils is 6.1, which most plants like that. Um, if you have a pH that is too low, some people will tell you to add lime. And if it's too high, it is more difficult to change, but you can lower pH by adding sulfur. But neither of those options are really sustainable because it doesn't last forever. But one thing that helps with the pH is compost, like organic matter, adding organic matter or compost to your soil will help to neutralize the pH. So whether it's a little high or a little low, just add some compost and that will help to, you know, bring it closer to neutral. Yeah. And another thing too, Tia, instead of thinking about, you know, altering the soils is just selecting the plant species that's going to be perfectly happy and suited for that acidic or maybe basic soils. Um, so for example, if you have a pH of eight, that's a really hard one, but there's going to be a narrow amount of plants you'll be able to select that will still do well in those soils. For example, our native sable, like I mentioned, or even if you're very acidic, like in the fours, you can select, you know, have blueberries here, hydrangeas, um, azaleas, they love it acidic. So if you pick a plant that's going to like it, you're going to do a lot, you know, better with your landscape planning than trying to alter that soil. Yeah, and some of those hydrangeas, their flower actually changes color based on the pH. So that's pretty cool. It is. So next, let's look at the hardscape. This is another thing like the climate that you can't really change. You just have to deal with like, you can't plant anything where your house is obviously, or if you have a concrete driveway or on your sidewalk next to your pool. Can be difficult. Also look above your head for the power lines and don't plant any you know trees that are going to get huge under some low-hanging power lines and also the roof overhang. You can see the picture on the right hand side here where you don't want to plant right next to the house. You want to leave a little bit of space uh, maybe like two and a half three feet to plant, you know, a shrub or something outside of your house. So leave that area right next to the house uh, very clean so you can maintain it and none of the plants are touching your house. Yeah, that's just a great general advice because you don't want to be watering plants that close to your house. Um, you don't want to be kind of cultivating maybe insects to coming in. So it's just good to keep about a foot away and then um, that plant's going to be able to actually receive rain and irrigation and all that good stuff too. Yeah, we see a lot of plants that are planted too close to the house and they're just drying out because the irrigation doesn't get to them and the rain doesn't get to them either. Mm -hmm. And you see those people, they like to grow the plants like up the side of their house, you know, but uh, that can be a, a high maintenance issue too. Mm -hmm. Maybe peel off your paint. So microclimates, here's some pictures that I just took this year of the banana plants. And so here in Central Florida, we got a freeze and you can see the ones that were a little bit in the understory of some other trees or some bamboo, they didn't get the frost damage like the one in the lower right where all the leaves are completely kind of frost burned and brown. Yeah, it's kind of amazing. Um... There's been research on what we call the urban heat island effect. And that basically just means that urban areas are warmer um, scientifically. So the data shows that within our urban areas, you know, we have a lot of concrete. And so if you're in a highly urbanized area, your landscaping is probably not going to get as cold as those more rural areas outside of town. Yeah, and there's a lot of different things that can cause a microclimate, like Tina was saying, concrete. Also, water bodies will kind of make like a little warm bubble around them. Absolutely. There are concrete walls. You know, if you have a brick wall on the south or west side of your house, it kind of absorbs that heat all day. So if you are trying to grow something you know, a little outside of our range on the tropical, that's a good place to put it, to have it protected. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and even large trees, you know, large trees can create their own little 
um, kind of microclimate. Mm -hmm. That's right. So that's kind of the basics of what you need to be looking for, you know, externally and characteristics of the environment. And with that information, what you should do if you're making a design is just do a rough sketch, kind of a little site assessment sketch. And instead of writing actual plant names, just write, you know, what are some of the pros or cons or just attributes of your site. It can be, you know, where is it sunny? Where is it shady? Where, where does the water sit around like a wet spot? It can even include like, oh, there's a bad view of the neighbor, you know, this way. So I wanna be sure to block that with some taller trees or something. That's right. Yeah, and this can be a really fun thing to do. You know, get out your home survey, get out your graph paper, get out those pencils and erasers and just kind of have fun with it, um, you know, and, and, and do that observation work. Yeah, with this diagram, then you can start thinking, okay, well, you know, vegetable gardens, they need sun, butterfly gardens, that needs sun. So what do I want to plant, you know, in my sunny areas? Or maybe you have a problem area in your landscape, you know, like that shallow, like little alley between two houses that's very dark and shady and your grass just doesn't want to grow and think of things that will work for that area. That's right. All right, so here's our next section. We're now gonna actually talk about plants. So um, the next section, we'll talk about plant status, whether it's native, non-native or invasive, the mature height and spread of the plant also needs to be considered. And then your needs, do you want it to produce food or attract wildlife? And you know, how many hours per week do you want to spend taking care of your yard and your gardens or you know, just other things, if it's a unique plant or a spiny plant, or if it has a good smell and is fragrant. So let's get started with the plant status. So most of the plants that we're going to be advocating for are native or non-native. And native plants, um, you know, they're the ones that were growing here a long time ago and they include you know some of our favorite trees like the oak tree or cypress the the cabbage palm that we keep talking about saw palm um, many species of hollies and also the kunti cycad which looks kind of like a fern and the the fire bush you know which is known as a great butterfly and um, hummingbird plant yeah, um, i like that one a lot yeah that's so pretty the non-native ones too um, you know, these are common ornamental landscape plants like the gardenia, liriope, zinnia, you know, they can be our edibles too, ginger, papaya, bananas, roses, like we were talking about. And then tell us about invasive plants. Yeah, so invasive species are plants that are not native and they're coming from some other part of the globe. Um, so it could be Australia or China or somewhere else, South America, and they arrived here by some way, shape, or form, either naturally or typically it's by human. Um, they came in on a, a barge or a plane or somebody brought them here to cultivate them, and they have escaped. And I know T and I really enjoy taking hikes in the woods and, um, you know, enjoying and recreating in nature. And what these invasive species do is they, if they're a vining species, they'll smother acres and acres of our native um, wilderness areas. And they really become a problem, not only eco, you know, for our ecosystem and environmentally, but they disrupt that food web and they cost taxpayers hundreds of thousands of millions of dollars um, statewide. And so it's really important that we select species that are not invasive and really um, select horticultural plants that are not gonna be in, an invasive issue. Some of those plants you might know, um, Brazilian pepper, really bad along I-95, bad throughout, you know, from pretty much Titusville over to Tampa. You know, we have it all the way through the state. Um, torpedo grass, that one is not only bad in urban areas, but also in, in wilderness areas. You can go to the middle of the Ocala National Forest and see it. Um, 
air potato, you know, we've had some success with that, with the air potato beetle um, as a biological control. However, it still persists in our state. And then coral ardesia, um, you know, so if you do have, I see a little question here popping up. If you have one of these invasive species, we recommend getting rid of it. And each one is going to need a different plan of action to tackle. Um, and so the best resource for that, and I can look it up, put it in the chat, is our Center for Aquatic and Invasive Plants at the University of Florida. They'll walk you through exactly how to get rid of Brazilian pepper, what herbicides are recommended, um, if you need to cut it and then use an herbicide, or some of these you can hand pull safely. But you know they really are pesky and very high maintenance. So um, it might be something that you think is going to fill in and make your landscape lush quickly, but it also will be something that starts to take over your neighborhood and our natural areas. So um, stay away from those invasives. They can really be a problem. And I have coral ardesia, the one pictured there with the red berries. I have that in my backyard and I pull it out by hand and it's, you know, good job security. I never get bored, you know, my landscape always pulling it up and trying not to let those berries seed for next year. Yeah, I do see a quick question about Mexican petunia. That's a good question, also known as Ruelia. And um, that one, it, there is an invasive um, species, but you can select cultivars that are going to be better. And then even better than that is our native Ruelia. So look for your native petunia, native Ruelia species if you're looking for something purple. Yeah, none of the nurseries should be selling any type of invasive plant that is, you know, known as a problem in the state. So the next thing we're going to talk about is mature height and spread. So here's a classic example, you know, a date palm that's planted way too close to the house. Um, this is not the right plant for the right place. It is a good plant for Florida, but maybe if they would have planted it about 20 feet further, you know, away from the house, that would have been the right place. So you want to look at how tall is the plant, how wide is the plant. Another thing we see a lot is the live oaks are planted like right next to sidewalks, and they do have strong root systems that will lift up and crack you know the sidewalk so we could do a little better job on the planning you know in our HOAs and stuff and select plants with a little less strong you know root systems to preserve our our sidewalks that's right you know we see them and they're just in a one gallon but you know just like humans they're going to grow up and and mature and get that full height and growth yeah, and so all this information, again, is in the Florida Friendly Landscaping Plant Selection Guide, and it will tell you the height and the spread for every plant. And, you know, depending on the, you know, character or, you know, you're just your site, you know, something might grow 10 feet in my yard and grow a little bigger in somebody else's yard, but they're pretty close on it. It's, it's a big difference if it's 30 feet or 60 feet versus like 10 or 15 feet. So you may want to select food producing plants for your landscape and there are a lot of edibles that you can plant for your landscape in Florida and here's just a couple of them that you know have been growing in my yard in Tina's yard or you know friends in the Orlando community like this passion fruit the avocado the dragon fruit uh, bananas do great here especially in wet spots a low quats are drought tolerant and they do good in dry spots. Um, papayas, mulberries, that's another that's good one. That's one of my favorite. I like mulberry because they're not only edible for us, but because wildlife love them. They're great for birds and um, just really build that ecosystem web. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you got like handfuls of mulberries this year. That was amazing that, that video you did about mulberry. It's a lot of fun. And actually, I just chatted. Um, T and I had a publication on Florida friendly landscaping um, for edible plants. So if you do like edibles, check out that publication. It'll give you more information. Yeah, following the nine principles, including like irrigation and fertilization and stuff. 
Also, like we have the turmeric listed here, turmeric and ginger, they're all in the same family, but that one goes dormant in the winter. So right now, you know, all my plants turn brown and look like they died, but really they're just dormant. Now's a good time to dig them up and share them with friends and then they will reemerge, you know, in, in May with some fresh new growth. Yeah, I like turmeric, it's very pretty. Good for teas. So there's a lot of other things that you could be growing in your yard, not only for yourself, but to benefit the wildlife. Here we have pictured some elderberries, um, those like wet and kind of part shade or sunny areas. Um, we have the caterpillar that is a monarch caterpillar and everybody should know what plant that one eats, the milkweed. Um, also berries for birds like holly berries and stuff. And um, in the middle, we have a little butterfly garden here with a purple Mexican sage in the center and a pink Drotropha in the background, some, some Galfinia and Liriope in there. And then that plant on the right, the favorite for the hummingbird that I see in my yard is that coral honeysuckle, which is a native vine. And those hummingbirds love those long tubular flowers. Yeah, I like that one. Um, that one might be good to start in a pot and then get it going because they are a little on the slow growing side from what I've seen. Um, so you want to kind of make sure if you put it in there that it, you know, make sure the weeds don't overrun it because I've seen that happen with that one. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I have I have a lot of squirrels in my yard. I, I really enjoy watching them like eat the oak acorns. They'll climb up into the sweet gum tree and like eat those little pokey balls that the sweet gum makes. Deer too, you know, the deer eat my landscape. They like that native fire bush. I had to put a fence around my garden so they didn't eat my garden. So here's a couple of examples of low maintenance plants and you might want to jot some of these down. These are these are some of our favorites. Um, starting from the top left, we have the Kunti cycad, which looks like a fern. And then below that is the Liriope. Um, the Kunti is native, whereas the Liriope is just like ornamental, but it does have little pretty purple flowers every once in a while. In the middle is our cabbage palm, the state tree. And that one, we were talking about how amazing it is. It can take the wet, it can take dry, it can take high winds like hurricanes. Um, and then to the right is that pink mooly grass, which just flowered here in the fall. And that's a real do nothing plant, no pest problems, no diseases, just give it a haircut after it flowers like in the fall or winter, like right about now, cut it back. And then in the bottom right is the shillings holly and that's a dwarf holly and that grows very slow so you don't have to trim it a lot that's a benefit of slow growing things is less maintenance that we that's at our extension center in orange county and we only trim that like two times per year and it keeps that nice ball shaped form so it might be good for some more formal landscapes but these that's are great. some of our favorite plants here yeah, we have that one too, the Holl the Shillings Holly. And one other quick thing I wanted to say on the cabbage palm is for palms, we don't recommend that hurricane pruning where you're taking up all the leaves, you know, so for maintenance of palms, you don't want to actually be removing all those leaves and just leaving that apex, um, you know, vegetation coming out the top. So because that actually opens the palm up more to infection and disease. So if you are going to prune your palms, you know, you don't have to, but if you are, don't take it more than say a, a 180 degree line from, you know, the, the top of the plant, because if you take it all the way, you're opening up for disease. And really, if you leave it, you're going to create habitat. So I've heard people say the bats roost in there, um, you know, little animals like to kind of go in there. So it can be bird habitat. Um, just something to consider to reduce that maintenance. Yeah, that's right. I heard they're like a uh, host species for, you know, a hundred different species like animals, birds, insects, and the berries are good food too. The flowers are good. Very good. 
So we want to avoid the high maintenance plants, but it's not mandatory. It's kind of up to you. Like if you want to grow roses, then just that's fine. And they can be Florida friendly, but just know they're going to require a higher level of maintenance. Another thing here is that palm tree, the date palm up in the top right. And those, they're not well suited for this area. You see that yellowing on the leaves very often. And that's because we don't have a lot of micronutrients in our soil. A lot of our soil is very sandy, very low nutrients. So when you see that yellow, um, it's from a micronutrient deficiency and we give it a special palm fertilizer. So you might have to buy that and apply that you know, once or twice a year. Also on the left-hand side, the lettuce plant, you know, it's fine, you can grow lettuce, but it's just short-lived. It only lives for 30 days and then you can eat it and plant some more. So um, in the bottom left is our podocarpus that's trimmed into a nice little ball. So podocarpus is a Florida friendly plant, but when you wanna have it shaped into this hedge, you will have to prune it a lot. So that's up to you on your personal preferences. Um, Tina, tell us about some other plant characteristics we can look for. Yeah, so, you know, some other things to consider if you have uh, pets or kids around or maybe a high traffic area, you see this big spiky one here, the silk floss, you know, does it has, have spines? Um, is it the crown of thorns or even roses? You know, those might not be suited for um, next to a, a walkway and a path. Um, another parameter is, is it deciduous or evergreen? So some of those are going to be dropping those leaves and those leaves can be a great resource for mulch. Um, but, you know, if that's not something you're looking for, then, it, you know, if you're doing it for blocking and screening, then that might not be a good choice. Um, I had mentioned the rate of growth. So if you want something that's going to kind of quickly vegetate an area, um, you'll want to select that species, but you know, if it's something that you can maybe, like I said, start it in a pot and then let it get a little bit more established and then transfer it over because you know it's going to be slow growing, but you really do want it. Um, just another thing to consider the form of the plant. So, you know, I do a landscape design class and we talk about does it have a whimsical feel like a grass? Does it have, um, you know, kind of a, a erect look to it, you know, like some of our junipers? Um, what are you looking to create in terms of structure and form in your landscape? Uh, one, one that I really like is fragrance. Um, others might be more sensitive to it. So, and there might be some that you love and some that you definitely do not love. So that's another thing to consider that if it's planted, you know, near your window and you're going to be wafting that in this time of year when you have those windows open, just something to consider, uh, which could be a lovely enhancement or if you're you know, partner or spouse hates it, that might, you know, not be good. Oh, yeah. I plant that butterfly ginger like all over my yard. That way, you know, when I go walk around, I'm like, mm, that smells good. That smells good. Yeah. You know, it's, it's, you know, it can really be very enriching. Um, so I talked about the spiny and then unique, you know, something that's kind of a specimen tree or even something that maybe is emotionally, um, you know, significant and unique for you personally. Um, and then bloom color. So like these caladiums are gonna come up only for certain times of the year. So just like we mentioned the turmeric, these caladiums are gonna go dormant this time of year. But as we pop in the spring and throughout early summer, they're gonna look really good and have that pop of color. So um, it could be in a bloom form, could be your brax. Um, which I'm thinking about the, uh, the horse mint, the spotted horse mint, you know, that has a beautiful, it's not a flower, but it's a beautiful leaf to it, those bracts. And, you know, like these caladiums just have a vibrant um, leaf color. So thinking about the color scheme of your landscape. Yeah, there's so many things to consider with plants and we're just keeping it short today. But, um, you know, we post a lot on our Facebook and stuff. So you can follow us there. Um, you can look up the Garden Florida Facebook. That's the one that I have for Orange County. Also UF IFAS Extension Seminole County. That's Tina's Facebook. Always posting stuff about plants. So much to learn about plants. And then also at the top is our Florida Friendly Landscaping link. And that's for our statewide 
Florida Friendly Landscaping Program that's up in Gainesville out of the University of Florida. And there are a lot of great resources on there. If, if you go to that website, that's where you can find this plant book and other um, great apps like your fertilizer app and a butterfly gardening app. Really nice. And then um, we just like to thank you for coming today and we will open it up for questions. If you would be so kind as to uh, use your smartphone and scan the little link for our very short survey or Tina can put that up in the chat box and you can write down our emails addresses, feel free to email us, um, especially if you're in Orange. This is me, Tia, I'm in Orange County, and then Tina is in Seminole County. And if you're not in one of our counties, um, then you can find your local extension agent for your county. 